Welcome to the Brew Crew Review Podcast, the show by fans for fans of your Milwaukee Brew. All right, Brewer fans, welcome back or welcome to the Brooker Review Podcast. Uh, my name is Craig, and co-hosting with me tonight is Vince Travato. How are you doing, Vince? Doing great, Craig. All right, and uh, we have a very special guest on our program tonight, uh, former Brewer pitcher Tyler Cravey, joining us from Arizona. Tyler, thanks for joining us tonight. Absolutely. Happy to be here. All right. So we're going to kind of just get right into it. Uh, if anyone, uh, our listeners aware that uh, former Brewer Tyler Cravey made his major league debut and pitched for the Brewers in the 2015 season after being drafted up back in 2009. Um, and so let's just start off kind of with your love of baseball. And, uh, you know, during your youth, um, when did you realize that, that you had, you know, ability to be a professional baseball player and, and, and at some point know that that was going to be a dream that you could realize? Um, well, you know, obviously it was, it was always a dream, uh, for, you know, most kids that grew up playing baseball, but, uh, realistically for me, it wasn't until my one lone year at junior college, um, did it actually seem like I had a chance because, uh, I was never a standout in high school. Um, you know, I didn't throw the hardest. I was around, uh, 84 to 86. Um, and then, the year after I graduated high school, I was actually hurt for an entire year. I didn't touch a baseball. I had to have a, a hernia surgery and it was kind of on the back burner uh, with things as far as, you know, dreams and career wise. Um, so I'd say, yeah, not until I was already 17, 18, uh, did I think that it was a possibility. Tyler, when you were, when you were in high school, did you primarily focus on pitching or did you play, you know, multiple positions? I know that, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because pitchers tend to be some of the best athletes uh, on a baseball team and, and often they're the best hitters. Did you, did you take pride in your offensive skills? Did you play multiple positions in high school? Yeah, I agree with both of those statements, uh, pitchers being the best athletes and hitters as well. <laughs> um, but no, I, uh, I grew up playing uh, every position, mostly shortstop, uh, center field when I was in the outfield. And I was, you know, fortunate enough to, uh, my dad built us a batting cage when I was uh, around 11. And, you know, he would pull me out of school early to just go hit 100 balls a day before games. So I took a lot of pride in the uh, the hitting aspect and fielding and just kind of, you know, being an all around player versus just a one dimensional pitcher. I guess as a quick follow-up, uh, by the way, that's awesome about your dad in the batting cage. That's, that's pretty amazing. But um, w when did you know that you wanted to be to, to be a pitcher? When did you know that you were going to focus on pitching? Was it just based on your skill set? Did you find that you loved that position more? Um, what what kind of led you to that path? Um, yeah, I uh, probably around high school, I just seemed to separate myself pitching from, you know, a lot of the other pitchers. I started throwing a curveball at 12 years old, which is probably not recommended for, for most, but um, around high school, junior year, um, my stats on the, on the mound seemed to separate themselves a lot. And um, that was kind of seeming like a standout position for me. So um, I was your success at Napa Valley college um led the brewers to scout you and uh eventually draft you in the 17th round of 2000 the 2009 draft um leading up to that draft and that and your last year at Napa, Napa Valley College how did that all play out as far as uh, were there multiple teams that you knew interested in drafting you or was it just the brewers and then when it came down to draft day how confident were you that your name was going to be called I guess um, there was a few different teams uh, reaching out and I had gotten, you know, you, you get those letters from scouts, um, Blue Jays, the Phillies, uh, the Yankees and, and a few others had reached out. Um, and I really wasn't positive, you know, I was going to be drafted at all. Um, so come draft day, I was kind of just following along and really hoping for the best. Um my pitching coach at Napa, Warren Brewster, he had actually played for the Phillies. He won a World Series with them. Um, and he was, you know, in talks a lot with 
his old uh, connections with the Phillies. So we were thinking the Phillies in the 18th round were going to pick me and as a shortstop. Um, but, you know, the Brewers beat him to the punch and uh, decided they wanted me to be a pitcher. So uh, I was just excited to to be picked at all. So uh, after you get drafted by the Brewers, was that how, how long was it between when you got drafted and when you signed? What what co- sort of, you know, deliberations went into your thought process? Did you just want to sign quickly and get into the system? How, how did that work? And, and could you kind of walk us through your your thought process and, and sort of how one takes that leap from being an amateur player to all of a sudden you're a, a professional? Yeah, so I, I kind of had it in the back of my mind. I knew as soon as, you know, I was drafted that I wanted to sign and, and start playing and, you know, not go back to school. I wasn't a huge fan of sitting in class. Um, so the Brewers made their initial offer and I think we countered and they agreed. And after that, you know, I signed and I think two and a half to three weeks later, I was on a plane down here to, to Arizona for rookie ball. Well, that's that's a pretty quick transition time. I mean, did you do you feel like you're you're prepared, you know, by the organization just generally? Uh, this isn't about the Brewers specifically, but do you think the guys generally are prepared to make that leap? Is there, you know, somebody that kind of walks you through that process? I just, you know, it it seems like it's a big life transition that happens, you know, relatively quickly. Yeah, um, I don't think a lot of guys are prepared for that, uh, especially you know the kids coming straight from high school and. They've never lived on their own um, and they're away from their family. I saw a lot of guys struggle with it. And I even did uh, for a while, even though I was a year older and went to to a junior college and then the high school guys, but it's kind of tough to prepare for. And you're kind of just thrown into the fire. There's not a whole lot um, that they can do for you on that front. It's kind of like, you know, this is it now. You're you're an adult, you're a professional and you kind of have to change your outlook on things as quick as possible. Yeah. And, and kind of last question as a follow-up before uh, Craig, I'll have you jump, jump back in. But th- so when you get into that role, are you, are you placed with a, like a foster family for lack of a better term? Did you live with a family during, you know, your initial foray into professional baseball when you went to Arizona? Um, no, we were just in a, we were all in a hotel together. We were at the Staybridge suites in Glendale and, uh, I got there and it was just a, a bunch of other young new draft picks. And we kind of all just stayed in that hotel for the summer. Um, and then the next year for the uh, rookie ball teams, they have an apartment complex where they have a ton of units and it's uh, there's, there is obviously regular people there as well, but that's usually where most of the team stays too. So that's kind of nice uh, being, you know, close to all your other teammates and in, in the same area. Yeah, I'm sure that leads to, to, you know, some good team bonding, probably, you know, in ways that are a lot different at that level of professional baseball than in the majors. Yeah, definitely. So another question, just focusing on that first five or so years of your minor league career, obviously uh, we're, we're heading to the question where uh, we're going to talk about your major league debut, which happened in uh, 2015. But uh, through from 2009, that first year, or you mentioned at rookie ball, all the way, so 2015, you're making your way through the system all the way up to AAA. Um, what, along that process, like what was, um, I guess, what, what in the back of your mind uh, reassured you that you were going to have a chance at the big leagues as opposed to all these other guys fighting for the same thing? Uh, or, did, you ever, did you have doubts along that way or were you confident that you were, that you were developing in the, on the right path to actually become a, a big leaguer? Um, yeah, so for the first few years, it was definitely tough and uh, it gets to a point where you're just, you know, trying to keep your job if you know you're not performing and doing well. Um, but it wasn't until uh, after you know, I had a pretty good season in high A and I went to the Arizona Fall League and did well. That's when it kind of sat in your mind that, OK, I, I have a chance of making it to the majors, um, you know, even despite all the tough years I did have in rookie ball and kind of the ups and downs there. Uh, Once you get to that, you know, double A mark and you start to put up good numbers, uh, anything can happen and you can kind of be called up from anywhere. So um, around that time is when I started to think, you know, it was within reach. And uh, now is when I probably should work as hard as ever and, and really do everything to get there. 
the Arizona Fall League, of course, is a really competitive league. So what was that experience like? And, and what kind of went through your mind when you were selected to play in the Arizona Fall League? Oh, it was great. And it was such a, a last minute thing. Um, and really that entire season, my my high A season, I, I started that year in extended spring training. And a lot of people don't know that I refused an assignment to go back to low A because I thought I had performed well enough the year prior. And uh, a lot of guys had gotten moved up and started the season in Brevard County. And I was told that, you know, a couple of days before that I was going to go back to Appleton and I wasn't very happy about that. So I, I walked in and, you know, I told Reed Nichols that uh, I'm not going to go back to Appleton. I think I'm good enough to go to uh, advanced day. So I'm going to stay down here in extended spring until, you know, a spot opens up. And then um, if you guys still want to give me a shot, I'll prove to you that I'm good enough. And fortunately, everything that happened that year worked out in, in my favor um, from guys going down and me being able to slide into uh, the rotation to getting that spot in the fall league um, because another pitcher uh, got hurt at the very end of the year. And I was, uh, I guess, the next guy on the bubble who had really good numbers in Brevard that year. So it was all a, a really quick and shocking, you know, transition period for me. I, I have to ask quick, how, how did, how did someone like Reed Nichols respond to that when, you know, he's got a guy in the system that is, is basically telling him, no, I, you know, that, that is a, I'm sure a really interesting experience from both sides. Do you think that the Brewers kind of admired your confidence in yourself? Do you think that they were, you know, kind of, you know, a bit put off by it? I mean, what was the reaction from somebody like Reed Nichols? Um, looking back at it now, I tell myself that they must have admired it. Otherwise, they would have released me on the spot. And I can't believe they didn't, which I remember, <laughs> you know, going home that day and telling my dad, like, they're sending me back to low A. I haven't given up a run all spring. You know, they got me uh, going back to here. And I told him I wasn't going. And he was like, you idiot. What are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, I'm yeah. just, you know, I'm tired. I thought this was a performance based industry. And uh, as we know, that wouldn't be the, the first time that issue arose. Um, right. But yeah, I like to think they they admired my confidence. And uh, fortunately for me, I was able to back it up when given the opportunity. Yeah, as beautiful as Appleton is, it, it seems like it worked out for the best for you that season. <laughs> can get a little chilly up there in Appleton, Wisconsin, that's for sure, as some of our listeners probably know. Um but uh, the next question then, obviously, finally, a big moment in, in your baseball career happened uh, in the early June of 2015. And you uh, tell us about the, uh, I guess, how you found out that you were getting the call to the big leagues for the first time. Yeah, so uh, I think it was a Sunday and it was a day game um, there in Colorado Springs. My grandparents were in town. Um, so the, the game got over pretty early and we were out at a, a restaurant getting dinner and um, we had finished up and I was driving back to my apartment and I got a call from a, a Washington number, which uh, I had, didn't know anybody in Washington at the time. So I nearly didn't answer, but uh, fortunately I did. And it was the manager, Rick Swede. I don't know why I didn't have his phone number, but I answered it and he was, you know, asking if I was busy on Tuesday. And I was like, what are you talking about? I like, no, I'm going to, you know, be here probably, you know, pitching. And he said, well, you know, pack your things. You're going to St. Louis. You're, you're getting called up. And uh, I had to pull over, you know, I was at a loss for words. Uh, I think the first thing I did was call my dad and he was ecstatic. Couldn't believe it. So it was uh, a really cool experience. Now, was any wow. any members of your family able to make it then for your, your debut, which I assume was that Tuesday against the Cardinals in St. Louis? Yeah, yeah, it was. I um, mean, yeah, my dad flew out, my brother, um, my mom, and then I, I had some, fa I have some family in uh, Nashville that drove over um, to watch. So I had a decent amount of people there, and fortunately, I did well for them. Yeah, you absolutely did. In fact, uh, if our if our listeners are interested in seeing part of that performance, I, I checked it out myself on YouTube today uh, under uh, Tyler Cravey's Major League debut, uh, debut against the Cardinals. I think he pitched seven innings, only gave up one run, six strikeouts. Uh, I was yeah pretty pretty impressed. In fact, I, I even remember seeing the highlights that I was watching that game, <laughs> of course, on cable television here in Wisconsin. I remember you inducing those like I think three double plays was it in your in your debut. 
Yeah, yeah, I got. I think I got more double plays that game than I had the last three years combined, which was surprising. <laughs> but what, once you actually take the ball to start the game, uh, and knowing all your friends and family are in the stands for that debut, how were you able to get get through that? You know, with how were the? I mean, the nerves and, and everything else, or just the, the experience, all the emotions that you're going through. Yeah, it's really, it's tough to explain because the adrenaline was at an all-time high and, you know, you can feel your heart racing and, and skipping beats and uh, really just trying to tell myself, like, just don't totally screw this up. Like, just have fun. Um, this may be the last time you're ever here. So just enjoy it and, you know, really work on everything that you've been doing and hope it works out. Did you have, uh, Tyler, did you have a, a you know, re deep or good relationships with a lot of guys on the team when you got called up or, you know, because it was your debut, did you really have to get to know some of the guys? I, I presume that you probably got to know some of the guys during spring training, but um, did you have a close relationship with any of the other guys on the team that season? Yeah, um, I had a, obviously an, I met just about everyone there in, in big league spring training and, uh, the year before I was up there for a little bit too. So got to know a lot of the guys and, you know, the veterans, uh, Matt Garza, Kyle Loesch, they were great about taking care of the young guys and really made you feel comfortable. And obviously Brawny, nicest guy in the world. So um, it was, you know, very easy to get along with those guys and, and comforting when I was there. Yeah, that's, I kind of would presume with some of those veteran guys and, you know, so is that is that typical? Did you have, uh, you know, anybody that really stood out as a mentor? I, and I guess that the uh, the follow up question to that is, is you know, as a pitcher, you come in and you're expected to know a system, and obviously you're working at that at the minor league level and in spring training. But how do you get on the same page with a catcher that you've never worked with before or haven't worked with since spring training that quickly? Uh, that part gets a little tough because uh, obviously they have you know their scouting reports and and they know these hitters you know better than I do. Um, but at the same time, it's like, uh, I don't know if I can get that high and in fastball 97 above his hands and buy him at this point. Um, um, but it's definitely a learning curve. So you guys, you have to compromise and just figure out what works best for the both. Um, and it's definitely a, a learning adjustment. So speaking of teammates throughout um, your major league, minor league career, one of our uh, favorite uh, Brew alums uh, here on the Brook Review is Tim Dillard, who's now working as a broadcaster for the Brewers, but he had a pretty extensive minor league career and kind of got a cup of coffee and whatnot, uh, similar to you at some point. But uh, I know that you, you probably spent looking, high, I'm sure you crossed paths with him possibly at, at least at AAA uh, in Colorado Springs, was it, during like 2015 through 17? Yep. Yep. We were there at the same time. Great guy. Absolutely loved him. He's, um, as you know, top five funniest guys on the planet. Um, great <laughs> veteran presence. So uh, it was, you know, him being a AAA definitely, definitely got a lot of guys through their season and, and helped a ton. You know, we should have researched this ahead of time, but uh, did you appear in any of Tim's uh, infamous videos? I, we, we did run into him not too long ago, so I'm sure he'd, he'd love to hear um, that, that we talked with you. And if you did appear in any of his videos, uh, we could send that to him. I did. Yeah, there was, I think, three or four that I appeared in. I think only one or two I was featured, um, but I was in a lot of those videos. <laughs> That's great. And, and that's a cool thing about Tim doing that is that not only was it cool content for, for people, fans of the Brewers or minor league baseball, but just really a cool thing to look back on and re reminisce uh, of your time together um, as teammates. Um, one, one quick question about just the overall the minor league experience and, and, and you've already kind of educated our listeners and us a little bit about, you know, you know, how that you kind of just like thrown out there after being drafted um, and, and the housing situation and all that stuff at the lower levels. Um, but as you worked your way up through each level, um, explain like the differences, if you if you wouldn't mind to our listeners about, you know, as far as when it comes to, um, you know, like the accommodations and, and even the compensation. Because I know just recently that Major League Baseball finally really uh, made some inroads to the compensa compensation to minor leaguers over this past offseason, I believe. But when I found out how, how much, uh, you know, ballplayers are being compensated, professional ball players in the minor leagues of major league teams 
uh, we're working like, you know, 12 hour days uh, all day at the ball field. And, and, and really, if you break it down per hour, we're getting like almost a minimum wage or something like that. Uh, I guess explain uh, about your experience that way and, and whether or not that was eye opening to you or if it was just something that, uh, you know, your, your drive and love of baseball got you through all that. Yeah, it was uh, it was very eye opening at first. Um, when I first got to Arizona, I think my my paychecks every two weeks down here were three hundred and thirty dollars. Um, now they took out some money for housing uh, every check, and then after taxes, it was about three thirty every two weeks. But um, you know that was three hundred and thirty more bucks than I made before, so um, that was nice. Uh, and then. A ball, I think it was up to 550 every two weeks. And then once I got to double A, it was finally around 850 bucks every two weeks. Um, and then triple A was kind of a nice jump where, where you would finally see a comma in the check. So that was nice. Um, and obviously it's it's night and day. Once you get up to the big leagues, you, you make more in one day there than you do in a whole month in triple A, which is pretty crazy. But um definitely an eye-opening experience with all the different levels and, and the pay structure. Yeah. And, and I, I guess, oh, go ahead, Greg, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I guess on the notion of pay that, you know, so I think it, it's, it's gotta be tough to go, you know, up and down between triple a and, and the majors. And obviously, you know, it happens to a lot of guys that it, it I know that there's gotta be on a, on a professional, a personal level, a lot of disappointment on, you know, uh, certainly, but, you know, when you consider the pay aspect of that, is that something that guys are really excited about when they do get that call? I mean, would you rather be a, a guy kind of on that fringe who goes from triple A to the majors up and down, up and down, or would you rather be somebody that's, you know, in triple A um, just consistently? Um, I think uh, I would definitely prefer the, uh, the up and down, up and down. Cause um, even, you know, one day up there, it's service time. It's, everything the accommodations from you know the hotel rooms the travel obviously a private jet's much better than you know some of our 330 wake up calls in Colorado Springs um so i would definitely take take that guy that's always up and down versus a, a just a steady triple a guy and then um kind of after your playing career had had wrapped up as a professional and in uh, July I believe of 2020 you actually wrote an article for the Players Tribune where you kind of touched upon you know I guess a, a, a traumatic shooting incident that happened way back when you were in high school and then also how you kind of overcame on your own um, uh, a slight like painkiller addiction as part of uh, in the, uh, one of the years in the Meyer leagues and um and all the way into to your um, you had other um, anxieties regarding flying on airplanes and whatnot. And I, uh, the article is really great. I would lo really love for listeners to definitely check it out. Um, and uh, I guess, can you just tell us a little bit how that article came about and, and what's been like the aftermath of people reaching out to you that have uh, been touched by that article? Um, yeah, sure. So, you know, at the time, um, I had read a few Players Tribune articles and um, it just looked like, you know, these players coming out and speaking their mind and kind of letting everybody know what's going on with them really helped them out and, and took a lot off their shoulders. Um, and at the time I was, you know, still struggling with some just day-to-day -day general anxiety. And I thought it, it would be a good idea to finally have an outlet and seek some help from, you know, anybody else. Um, and I had, tons of you know former teammates and uh, other professional athletes reach out and uh, explain you know they had the same issues or they're still going through it and kind of what they did to to help um so it, the whole thing was really great and i uh, i originally just you know reached out on twitter to the the players tribune and um kind of just asked if i could you know tell my story and um really seeking some some feedback that could benefit myself and help me to kind of get better Tyler, did you have did you have teammates or did people in your organization know that you were through this stuff? You know, during your playing days, I I think you touched on that in the article a bit, but I, I guess I'm curious as to you know what it, if anything was being done, you know, at that time to kind of address some of those things externally. I understand the the 
you know, that there are other factors here too, but it, it seems to me like it would be a really tough, tough environment to be in, to have a fear of flying, for instance, and then have to fly all the time for your job. Um, that must've been a really difficult, very difficult to focus on your career. Yeah, it, it definitely got tough. And um, we did have a, a team, you know, psychiatrist who was uh, in the organization. He would travel to uh, all the levels a couple times a year and he was aware um, and we actually they prescribed me some uh, some form of Xanax to take to help with the flying. But I just it was impossible to, you know, take that and then be expected to perform the same day. I would just be a zombie down in the bullpen and it got really tough for a while. Some of those triple a years um and you know that was definitely it took a big toll on it and uh not easy to pitch when you're you know going through that and and flying every three to four days um but they were aware and we kind of did what we could but uh at the end of the day it's kind of something like if you if you can't overcome this uh safely on your own you know without having to, to self-medicate then um it just might not be a good idea for you know me to continue to do that right i really want to commend you on writing that article because um i believe it was titled maybe you can help me is that correct yeah yeah it was close to that yeah so so i mean in my experience it's people that have um you know mental health or other addiction type issues always have a hard time making that step of asking for help or trying to seek out the help. And, and uh, really, really, I think that um, writing that article really probably impacted a lot of people that read it, I'm sure. And, 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 you know, gave them, you know, the, the confidence to kind of, um, you know, swallow their pride and, and, and reach out for help and possibly even relate to, to your experiences. So I really think that, that, writing that article was a great thing for you to do and i really commend you for for um you know swallowing your pride and and and, and having the the um the confidence to do such a thing and, and that was really cool I, I know when i got to the end of the article and there was a picture yeah, yeah, you, thank you. when i got to the end of the article myself and there was a picture of you playing with your your kids that that, that really that really hit me in the feel so to speak so <laughs> i i could uh i could yeah I, yeah it was, it was it was a great great very very moving article um speaking of, of, of your kids i don't know if um how has uh becoming a father uh, impacted your life i guess oh in the best way possible you know it's uh the best thing in the world and the kids are awesome um they're both happy healthy that's all you can ask for but uh just that feeling of you know being a father and there's you know something more to to your life now um you know being responsible for them it it really gives you more of a purpose in life to me and uh i think it's great and then um Tyler, just, oh go ahead then sorry i was just gonna ask so do you do you miss baseball now with you know all these new responsibilities and things that you've got going on in your life i know that things you know, when when things did end in Milwaukee, I know that there was uh, there were a few things that were said in the media and um, some quotes that you had towards the the David Stearns run Brewers at the time. Are, are you still do you still think about that? Are you still um, do you still follow baseball generally? I mean, what are your what are your thoughts right now on the game in 2023? Yeah, uh, you know, I definitely miss the game. Uh, I'm probably in better shape now than I ever was. So I'll turn on a game and still tell myself you know, I could definitely do this right now. I could uh, be in this bullpen <laughs> right now. So yeah. um, even at the, you know, the elder age of 33, I still like to think I'd be able to compete and uh, definitely think about everything that happened. Um, but, you know, I try not to live with any regrets. Uh, you know, I've been so blessed with everything I have now. And looking back, uh, you know, there was a lot of guys that didn't speak up and, you know, they're in the same position I am now out of the game. And um, so I, I try to tell myself, you know, not don't have any regrets. It is what it is. Um, obviously, things could have went differently, but um, at the end of the day, you know, here I am, happy, and I'm yeah, I'm still not rolling out a comeback. So one of these days, I'll, I'll pick up a ball and start throwing again, and uh, hopefully, there's some 97s on the radar gun. <laughs> That's great. Hey, it's been done before. Yeah. So I guess kind of the to. Toward the end of the interview here, uh, just 
uh, did do you what are I mean, what are your currently um, you know going on in your life and do you have any other post uh, baseball career goals that you that you're still working toward? Um, so I've been at a healthcare staffing uh, agency now for just over three years and uh, it's great. They're a uh, family owned and operated and we're right down here in Scottsdale and you know there's tons of flexibility, freedom and the works you know not the hardest stuff ever so. I enjoy it. Um, but as far as, you know, any other post-career endeavors, I don't really have a ton on the uh, agenda. I kind of just take it day by day and watch the, the kids grow up and uh, try to be a good husband and father to them. And whatever happens, happens, I guess. <laughs> That's great, Tyler. I, I do have one more quick uh, follow-up baseball question here, Craig, before I'll hand it back to you. but. Um, I have to ask this is because I've always wondered myself, what was it like to hit a home run at the big league level? You've got one career home run uh, in the major leagues. Uh, I think it came against the pirates. If I'm not mistaken at, at then Miller park, um, that must've been a pretty awesome feeling. Can you, can you describe that? What, what was it like? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's the most vivid memory I have of my entire career and, you know, stepping into the box and everything I can still, it's like it happened, you know, two hours ago. It was definitely the, the coolest feeling uh, of my entire baseball career. And, you know, I'm just thankful Jeff locked through a fastball there because I was selling out for that and only that. Um, and yeah, looking back, it's still pretty surreal. Um, coolest thing uh, uh, that's ever happened. I, I have to admit I was out, I, I was eating somewhere uh, and I, the game was on a TV and I did cheer out loud. I, it was, it was awesome. I very much remember that moment. I'll have that's to admit. cool. That's very cool. And then as far as I'm sure there's a lot of guys that you play with in the minor leagues that are still um, niching out my uh, uh, major league careers, potentially. Are those type of guys that you kind of follow or keep 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 dibs on, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely still keep keep track of, uh, you know, all the guys I played with and, and roomed with and see how they're doing and uh, give them a hard time if uh, they had a bad outing. <laughs> it, that, that role being a good teammate never does end does it oh no definitely not <laughs> that's great all right tyler well we really appreciate you joining us here for this podcast and uh you know really giving me some insight on on what it's like to be a professional baseball player uh you know through your experience and like i said i i, I really commend you for writing the article that you did uh, in the Players Tribune, I, I really think that, you know, it, it, it'll impact anyone who, who reads it. So again, to our listeners, if you haven't checked it out, please uh, go ahead and make sure to put that in the Google search or whatnot. Tyler Cravey's The Players Tribute article, um, and definitely it's a must read. So well, well, we're going to re, uh, we can find that and, and send that out again on social media as well. Uh, along with Craig, the, uh, the game that uh, you found on YouTube with Tyler's debut. So we'll send both of those out via social media when we post the interview. Awesome. awesome. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Hopefully we'll see you back on a mound somewhere in professional baseball. If you're, if you're lighting up the radar guns in the backyard uh, with your kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll keep you updated and let you guys uh, know how that one goes. Sounds great. Thanks again, Tyler. We really appreciate it. All righty. Take care. All right. You too. Bye. Thanks. Do, 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 do.